good afternoon good evening and i am not sure uh, yeah so if you are across the world and um, so i'm going to talk about uh, coding theory for uh, various applications uh, so this is going to be on communication storage and computing and uh, in case uh, you know because it is mainly towards students so this is only kind of uh, motivational and uh, perhaps uh, just uh, highlighting the applications um, uh, not so much going into detail uh, it's only saying that uh, you know these kind of research areas exist and um, they're very interesting um, okay um, i mean i worked in most of these areas but um, uh, as i said i'll only give the problem statement what is uh, going on and uh, perhaps um, uh, tell you what are the breakthroughs which have happened in the past uh, maybe a decade or more maybe two decades okay um, yeah and as you can see all of these communication storage and computing all are very important applications okay so first we will begin with coding for communication uh, so this is uh, just an illustration of a binary symmetric channel so whenever we talk about communication, there is a channel, uh, there is a transmitter, there is a receiver, and uh, there is a channel uh, between uh, the transmitter and receiver. And the simplest channel that you can think of is binary symmetric channel, where uh, I have a, I want to transmit a zero and a one. Okay. And, uh, but um, because the channel is something which introduces noise, uh, the zero and one can you know you can get the zero as it is or there is a certain probability with which it gets flipped okay and that is called p yeah that is called the crossover probability and uh, the it's called a binary symmetric channel because you have as inputs zero and one and uh, the crossover probability is symmetric so it means that if i transmit a zero um with the probability p i get a one similarly if i transmit a one with the probability small p i get a zero right Okay, uh, so what was the breakthrough result in this is uh, what is a term which is known as a channel capacity. So um, this is the image of Claude Shannon, who is, uh, you know, regarded as uh, the father of information theory and you can say father of digital communications that way. Uh, the reason being that uh, he came up with um, a particular notion of what is known as channel capacity. So this depends only on the channel. It doesn't depend on what input you are giving to the channel. So for example, if I just give you this binary symmetric channel, we can determine what is known as channel capacity. Uh, and uh, you can kind of think of it as if it is like how many bits I'm able to send through the channel whenever I use the channel once. Okay. And uh, it is, as I said, it is dependent only on the channel characteristic. And uh, a good thing about this channel capacity is that it is a fundamental limit of communication through any channel. So which means that uh, I have this particular number. And if I somehow transmit at a rate which is below the channel capacity, then I'll be able to get the message across with very low probability of error. So I'm kind of mentioning a lot of words to you. I'm just assuming that you know you will be able to make some sense out of it. If you have taken a communication course, um, a few of these terms do make sense. But um, otherwise also, I mean, colloquially you can understand what probability of error means and so on. So that is, uh, yeah. So if you transmit at a rate below the channel capacity, uh, then you can get very low probability of error somehow. And uh, for any rate above the channel capacity, uh, no matter what you do, uh, you cannot get a probability of error which is small. Okay, So that way, it is like saying, I, I mean, uh, you want to achieve this uh, channel capacity somehow. You want to transmit at that rate because you want to obviously send more bits through the channel. But the channel capacity kinds of gives a fundamental limit. You cannot transmit anything about channel capacity. Okay. So uh, what are the breakthroughs in this? this? So this result itself was known in 1948 in one of the seminal papers which Anna, Shannon wrote. And it is known as the mathematical theory of communication. You can look at it. Uh, it is very, I mean, it's one of, of course, one of the most highly cited papers. But then afterwards, 
um, you know, even for 50 years, let's say, uh, the researchers were uh, trying to develop codes um, which achieve this channel capacity. Okay? Um, how come it was not there in the Shannon's paper? The Sh Shannon's paper actually argued that there exist some random codes. Okay? But random codes are not easy to implement. So that is the reason it's like, even though he has shown existence of codes, which achieve the channel capacity, it's still not like a practical result because you cannot implement them. Okay. So then there were two classes of codes which um, kind of uh, get very close to the capacity. There's one more class also, but these are more recent. So that's why I'll just talk about them. Um, one is called the low density parity check codes. In short, they're also called LDPC codes. And the second class of codes are known as polar codes. Okay. Both of them go, I mean, polar codes achieve capacity LDPC codes come very close to capacity. Okay. Um, again, a little bit of history on the discovery of LDPC codes. So there's a person known as Robert Gallagher. Uh, he's at MIT and um, uh, these LDPC codes were discovered in 1960s itself uh, by Robert Gallagher in his uh, PhD thesis. Okay. And um, I think, uh, yeah, so at that time, it was like more of a theoretical study because whatever codes he had developed, right, there was uh, not uh, enough uh, hardware, okay, hardware advancements uh, to be able to implement them, okay. So only in late 90s, let's say, when another set of codes also became popular and there was advances in hardware, these LDPC codes were rediscovered, okay. So it was lying there in her thesis. I mean, people did make theoretical advances, but never maybe, you know, gave an attempt to implement them. But then in 90s, there was renewed interest in these codes. And then, <clears throat> so, yeah, so just ignore this parity check matrix, low weight code words, et cetera. But then the low density parity check means something. So the, every code has an associated parity check matrix with it. And uh, if that is made of somehow sparse, kind of entries, in particular, every row is of low weight, then it is called a low density parity check code. And um, for applications, so uh, yeah, so I think this alignment is not great, but LDPC codes are applied, I mean, they have applications in digital video broadcast, ethernet, 5G uh, data channels, all these standards have LDPC codes now as part of them. So you can imagine, so it's like, you know, getting into a standard is a very big thing, uh, let's say for any of these codes and um, uh, which means that they are actually beating a lot of contenders, contender codes and uh, showing good performance. And that's the reason they are in the standards. Okay. And uh, uh, one very straightforward reason why they are is um, two reasons. One is that uh, they achieve capacity, which means they, are, they achieve in the sense they come very close to the capacity. Uh, and that is very important because if we, uh, some codes are able to operate, not able to achieve capacity, let's say, uh, then uh, we are still off from the optimal, right? So which means that we are not using the physical channel that we have in a very good way. So, uh, and the second reason why these codes became so popular is that their encoding and decoding complexity is very low, in particular the decoders. Uh, there is a, a certain algorithm known as belief propagation and that can be highly parallelized and can be done super fast on uh, let's say chips and so on okay uh, of, of the order of let's say even uh, they, it kind of operates at uh, 15 mbps and that kind of speeds which is very very hard okay and um, and all these things are scale well okay so even if i pick a code whose length is very large even then all these properties hold for LDPC codes and that is the reason they are very popular, okay? So that is about the LDPC codes and the second set of codes known as polar codes, which were discovered by uh, Professor Erda Larikan from uh, uh, university in uh, Turkey, I guess Bilkent University, I guess, uh, in 2008, okay? Um, I mean, why is it even a class apart as opposed to LDPC codes? Both are uh, more or less, you know, they perform very well in practice, but polar codes are also, you know, provably uh, capacity achieving, which means you can prove math results with them uh, for binary input memoryless channels. And uh, they do have low encoding, decoding complexities and so on. So it's like a perfect 
match of various properties which we want and you know between 2008 and 2019 he has received shannon award for his contributions and uh, Shannon Award is the highest award in information theory society. Okay, and with respect to being in the standards, it's also used in 5G control channel. Okay, so control channel has slightly lesser uh, length of the packets, and um, uh, I think uh, that is used. So these are two very uh, codes which have kind of you know revolutionized the field of uh, coding for communications, and now it's like point to point communication is very well understood in general. Okay, so that is the uh, application of communication. Uh, the second application I will talk about is coding theory for distributed storage. Um, I mean, I'll give uh, some overview of a system and kind of tell uh, some two sets of codes, just mention them. Yeah, but they are again, come from very good groups and so on. So this distributed storage system, this is a particular system which, um, you know, what happens is whenever I have a file and you want to store it on a Facebook, uh, in, a no, in a Facebook data center or any data center, then it is divided into small blocks and those blocks are randomly placed in what are known as nodes okay and they are placed with a certain replication and uh, by default the replication factor is three um and uh, these is i mean the replication factor kind of gives you the redundancy in case of node failures okay and uh, this kind of thing happens with hundreds of nodes in a facebook cluster actually there are thousands of nodes Okay, but then this is actually if you see the storage overhead that you have is kind of 3x, which means that for A, you're storing twice the um, twice more, you're storing 3x the amount of data, and which is generally wasteful if you see the rate at which the data is growing. And uh, in that case, codes become helpful in the case, in the sense that if you see here, you know, you just don't store the replicas, but you store some linear combinations of the packets as well. And uh, uh, here, what I have shown is a code. Um, it's coded data. A, B, C are normal, but this A plus B plus C, actually, if you see it semantically, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. But still, they, it does give the redundancy that you want. And uh, previously, if you see uh, whatever it was giving, like I was storing nine copies, here I'm storing still five, but it gives the same amount of you know st tolerance to failures as the previous one and that's why these are very popular in the sense that it's very um, you know uh, tolerant to node failures but then there have been two classes of course recently if uh, which uh, wanted efficient repair properties also so repair is a slightly orthogonal direction as compared to the storage overhead and uh, there were two classes of codes uh, one uh, was called regenerating codes this uh, came from a group in berkeley and uh, there's another codes called codes with locality which uh, came from microsoft research and uh, these are just illustrations of some codes i mean the way they are stored etc i will not expect you to understand that but uh, the way it is is uh, in one case you know efficient repair is accomplished by minimizing the repair bandwidth itself and in another case by uh, minimizing the number of nodes accessed and these two codes kind of uh, came around 2010 a little before and after kind of and uh, there's been a lot of research uh, you know with respect to constructing these codes proving properties with respect to these codes in the last um, uh, eight years or more okay uh, so that's what has been happening and um, not that they are just in theory they have also been uh, used in practice because as I said, one of the codes, the codes with locality, which are also known as LRC here, locally repairable codes, they were originated in Microsoft Research. So they have, you know, um, a clean way to kind of deploy their solutions as well. And uh, it has been deployed in Azure storage, Windows servers, uh, and so on. Okay, so this, uh, uh, and similarly, They've also been in, so this is like um, enterprise versions, right? But uh, even in open source kind of systems like uh, HDFS, which is Hadoop distributed file system and Ceph as well, uh, these codes have been implemented, okay? So that is with respect to codes for storage. The last topic, which I'll just touch upon very briefly uh, is codes for distributed computing. Uh, here, the problem setup is again, slightly different. And since um, we look at distributed computing applications, any of the machine learning applications which run divide their job into to run on um, several nodes okay and uh, this is just a framework where there is a master and there are all these worker nodes the master kind of divides the jobs and gives them to the worker nodes and the worker nodes send their outputs 
and the master somehow aggregates these outputs in order to accomplish the task whatever it is it could be a simple gradient descent or you know matrix multiplication or several things like this okay but then what is uh, known is that uh, there is something known as straggler problem which means that there will be some slow nodes in the system and um, uh, if you are just plainly dividing it then uh, it's like you know the master has to wait for all the nodes and the slow nodes are the ones which form the bottleneck with respect to finishing the jobs okay and um, this is just a curve which shows you know that um, out of some number of workers some i mean a fraction of them will be very slow in general okay so which means that they will kind of form a bottleneck for you in order to uh, when you try to um, compute the job execution times so then what is the solution to that is introducing redundancy again one way of introducing redundancy is just to replicate but um, wherever there is replication uh, there will be a better way of uh, introducing redundancy and coding has been used for you know distributed matrix multiplication gradient descent polynomial evaluations etc Okay, so all this is very, very recent work and, uh, you know, there were many, in all the work that I've described, there are many award winning papers and uh, information series society and you know, it has gone all the way to practice. So these are the applications of coding theory, which I wanted to see and I worked in um, more or less all the applications I mean, more in storage and computing but recently I'm doing work in communications as well. Okay, so with that I would like to conclude and I'll be happy to take questions. Mm -hmm.